Hi, this is uh, Dr. Duncan Ferguson of the University of Illinois InvetMed Academy. I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators uh, from the Veterinary Educators and Pharmacology Special Interest Group, Drs. Normandy, Vendrick, Verlar, and Chambers, uh, for without their help, this project would not have been possible. This joint project between uh, Veterinary Educators of Pharmacology Special Interest Group and VetMed Academy we're going to talk about the drug regulations associated with food animal practice. And I'm going to do this through interviews of faculty members of EPSIG um, that were from the UK, Holland, representing the EU, uh, and Colombia, representing South America to some extent, and New Zealand. And in this uh, process, we're going to use a case scenario to highlight uh, the major points. Uh, I will summarize things at the end. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to see those points uh, in written form at the end. And I hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. I really appreciate all of the faculty that contributed uh, to this. And also I learned quite a lot along the way. So I hope you do as well. Um, okay, let's move on to that second scenario that uh, I was thinking about, and that getting us to food animals, uh, and specifically just to create a conversation. And I noticed you have a background in antimicrobial resistance, so maybe <laughs> you can comment any way you want to on this. Um, treating mastitis uh, in, a, say, a two, three-year-old uh, heifer, um, that uh, what would be the first line, you know, what is what drugs would be the first line drugs? And in food animals, and is there any, uh, um, how would this be determined? So, so again, it's quite similar. Um, the cascade follows the same rules um, for farm animals with just a, a couple of stipulations as well. Um, so the first line treatment generally for um, mastitis, having consulted with my farm animal colleagues, um, is generally beta-lactams um, and aminoglycosides. Um, uh, for dry cows, there, there's a similar choice, um, but there's, there's slightly fewer drugs available. Um, some of the drugs have been, say, authorized for a particular type of mastitis. Um, so cloxacillin is used for penicillin resistant staphylococci. So um, you can choose, you should be choosing um, an appropriate um, antimicrobial based on, on the suspected issue. Um, there, I think that it's really important that we do sort of follow those first line, line drugs. Obviously, in in this sort of scenario, we where we have resistance, there's additional things to consider. Um, and if your treatment isn't being successful, and you do end up um, selecting something that isn't authorized necessarily for that condition in that species, um, it does still have to have had a maximum residue limit determined um, in a food animal. Um, so in Great Britain, there's a specific list that is um, named the Great Britain Maximum Residue Limit Register, um, which is useful um, for Northern Ireland. Um, they're still using the EU regulations. So there's a table published online by the EU um, regulation uh, 37 slash 2010, and in one of the annexes, there's a whole list of, of drugs that have a maximum residue limit. Obviously, if you're using products under the cascade in this way, um, you need to um, state um, like statutory withdrawal, withdrawal periods um, that are, are defined. Um, so seven, seven days for milk, 28 days for meat because obviously they won't be defined in that particular species for that condition and always make sure um, you're checking you're checking that so we have different um, statutory limits for animals that have been treated under the cascade is there you mentioned um, is there a list of drugs we have this in the united states mm -hmm. uh, uh, that are absolutely banned for use at any level in food um, no, we just we have a list of what you can use, not a really? list of what you can't. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that that's the way we we tend to go. Um, so you're saying you're saying you have a list of approved drugs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's you... those drugs that have that maximum residue limit defined, um, only oh. those drugs can be used. Those are what on, are on those lists. And if they're not so, on that list, no. So in the U.S., we have, you know, a list of banned drugs, and it's, mm -hmm. it boils down to one, two, three, six or seven drug classes, mm -hmm. a few of which are antimicrobials. The most prominent yeah. is chloramphenicol because yeah. of human, you know, um, toxicities. Yeah. And then um, when you get the extra label use in those species, uh, veterinarians are encouraged to um, establish the appropriate withdrawal time using the food animal residue avoidance data bank, which is FARAD, which is uh, a online, now online service that helps them guide, you know, their choice or length yeah. of withdrawal. Yeah. But, but in that situation, you'd have to, you know, well, be highly well documented uh, with the with the farmer, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And, yeah. and in some case, you still are at, at risk of responsibility if a residue is found in the, in the yeah. milk tank. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think in terms of those standard withdrawal periods I was talking about, we talk about it with with, with our students, we do say, think about due diligence. The standard with, withdrawal period for milk might be seven days, but if you look and the with, withdrawal period defined from for all of the species, milk is 28 days, maybe you want to consider what would be more appropriate. Those standard withdrawal periods are kind of the minimum um, that you would do. So for, for eggs, it's seven days, milk, seven days, 28 days for meat. You, you may have already, the last question I had about this scenario was, you may have already answered it. Um, you know, if you found a resistant staff, some res drug that brought you outside of the, the drugs that are already on your list, what are, what are the options? Uh, are, they, are they pharmaceutical or are they management at that point in, in the UK? So, so um, the majority of uh, dairy farms in the UK are, um, are a, a member of what is called a red tractor assurance scheme. Um, and they, they, they detail uh, requirements for use of certain antimicrobials. So if it was things like um, critically important antimicrobials that were the only thing they um, were susceptible to, you could put, make an argument for using those, but only if necessary testing had had been undertaken at, as is detailed by the red, red tractor scheme itself. Um, so the, the red tractor scheme is a voluntary thing, but the majority of uh, farms do follow that as well. And that gives really clear guidance on you shouldn't be using these antimicrobials unless there is clear and defined evidence that it's the only, only thing that you can do. And obviously, I mean, we have critically important antimicrobials de de defined by the World Health Organization. Um, and that's for humans, but with the OIE obviously defines um, critically important antimicrobials for animals as well. So I think it's important that, well, for all of us really, that we keep abreast of what's on there, what the guidance is on there, and schemes like the Red Tractor scheme for us um, do keep abreast. And it, you know, farmers know what those uh, farmers and vets know what those those um, for, like for third and fourth generation cephalosporins, uh, fluoroquinolone, things like that shouldn't be used unless absolutely necessary. Um, so, so if an animal was, the choice was, we're going to have to cull this animal, but let's say the animal is a highly valuable you know, genetic, you know, a breeder, a breeder for example, um, would, they, would they be able to keep that, as, you know, to save that animal, if you will, if it had a, a very serious systemic infection with one of these drugs and then just not keep, not allow it back into the food chain? Is that is that option available to a vet? Um, so basically it, it could be available, but there needs to be a, a vet report saying that- That's what you're these, doing. These are the tests. Oh, that, even so, that, right. That this is why we think we can save the animal with this drug because of the evidence so they will look back over what's been done before on the farm um, and use that to inform what's what's done moving forward but they definitely want the evidence that those antimicrobials would be the only option available and that can't Very just good. come from the farm it has to come from from the vet report 
Uh, I think we did the, 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 the newest guideline for mastitis is more based on the clinical signs than on the bacterial culture. We used to have a, a guideline based on culture, but well, in the first instance, of course, you don't have a culture yet. Right. So we speak of mild mastitis and severe mastitis or grade one, two and grade three. Um, and then the, the approach is, is different with a mild mas mastitis. Well, you think mainly of gram positives and the cow is not, not uh, systemically uh, ill. So we, the first choice uh, treatment, well, we have intramammary treatment with cloxacillin or uh, penicillin, procaine, uh, benzyl penicillin uh, or cloxacillin. Those are first choice uh, in the, the uh, antimicrobial policy uh, here in the, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, well, and then you, of course, you, you, you take your sample and you culture and you, uh, in a few days, you know the sensitivity and well, which bacteria it is. So if it's necessary, then you can change your therapy uh, and perhaps it's needed to take another first choice antimicrobial or to take a second choice antimicrobial or even a third. That is possible if you have the argumentation, if you have the, the sensitivity uh, test. Okay. Uh, which proves that uh, for systemic treatment for mild mastitis, we also have some options. In the first choice, we have uh, penicillin, but then uh, in in a in an alkalic uh, form, like penetamaz. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you're familiar with that. Or we have uh, tilosine, some some small spectrum uh, macrolides, and. Well, those are the most uh, logical. We also have TMPS registered for mastitis, but well, that's less logical because, well, of course, it doesn't work that well in the other. And you don't have Trimet a systemic trimethoprim, trimethoprim, trimethoprim so, sulfur. Yeah. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's not a logical choice. That is perhaps a logical one for severe mastitis where you want to treat a systemic infection. Uh, so those are the first choice choices we have mainly. I can show you the document as well, if that's nice. So this is the grade one now or two mastitis, mainly gram positives. And this uh, one I, I talked about, cloxacillin or penicillin. And then the second choice is, the, those are intramammary treatments. So the second choice is less logical. So mainly broad spectrum beta lactams. Well, that's not, not necessary when you have a, either a streptococcus or a staphylococcus. Mm -hmm. and some combinations with uh, even aminoglycosides, but those are of course more logical when you have gram-negative infections. But this is mainly based on the, on the sensitivity test, uh, on the sensitivity right. of the bacteria. So you have to have an argumentation to do this, but those preparations are all on the Dutch market. So we all have registered right. preparations with these compounds. So you can use them if you have the argumentation. Those are all allowed in food producing and milk producing uh, uh, cattle. Okay. Uh, so these are the ones for, uh, for systemic treatment I talked about just now. Um, and then second or even third choice, again, based on, I think based on sensitivity and those ones are actually not logical because they don't reach, reach the milk in sufficient concentration. So those are logical in severely, severe mastitis and systemic disease and not in only uh, infection of the other, right? right? So, well, that's in summary. So you, have, have. so you have a list of those. These are all approved if you make your documentation again. Do you have any, do you have a list of uh, in the EU of drugs that are banned or not approved? Yes, we have. I have the, 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 the commission regulation uh, here, European uh, regulation, the 37, 2010. And this is a list of the two lists, the two annexes, one list with allowed substances within Euro, within the EU, I must say. Um, and the second list is banned substances. So those are not allowed. And of course, when you're not on a list, you're also not allowed. <laughs> right. But, well, so these uh, table one is compounds with 
uh, uh, an MRL, a maximum residue limit. And then you can see if it's allowed for milk producing animals as well. So this one, for instance, is not allowed for milk producing animals. There's no MRL for milk. Some compounds, of course, no MRL uh, necessary. So you can allow, uh, use them. If you use them, that's usually through cascade use. And then you have a usually a withdrawal period of seven days for milk. Uh, but the registered compounds, of course, uh, they, they have an MRL on this list and the, the pharmaceutical company has done research into uh, the, the, the withdrawal periods. And they of course have a withdrawal period for milk and for meat on the SPC. Um, so yes, perhaps we can, this is a long list. So, also, so do I can send it to you. And then at the end, there's the, the Annex 2. Those are the, well, forbidden compounds and for antimicrobials, and that's the, the chloramphenicol okay. and the metronidazole and the nitrofurance. Yeah. Right, that looks very familiar uh, to us in the United States. We have a, a prohibited drug for extra yeah. label use and it mainly for human safety. Uh, yeah. Chloramphenicol would be the one drug here, and, you know, as an antimicrobial that might be um, chosen could be chosen i suppose for this particular indication and obviously shouldn't be no this one this is our it's perhaps also nice to show this is our document for the the policy around antimicrobials um it's in dutch but i think it's quite this states for instance that carbon panems gycopeptides uh well these antimicrobials are not allowed at all in, in animals in, in, uh, within the Netherlands or within the EU. So also not through cascade use. Those are reserved for humans. Right. Colistin, there's a lot to do about colistin as well. So you can still use it in, in pigs, but only on the specific circumstances with specific argumentations. Uh, and here is an overview of what are first, second and third choice antimicrobials. So with green, yellow, and orange, and the red ones are prohibited for food producing animals. So the, those uh, do not have an MRL or, well, are not, or are prohibited like we talked about. And this is in a table. So here you can see all compounds with uh, first, second choice or prohibited. So that's perhaps also a nice right. overview. So you have a very detailed you have a very detailed guide guidance with withdrawal times uh, for mm -hmm. food, and is there any indication like we have in the United States where we have the food animal residue avoidance database from, that's uh, managed? And I think I've heard that some um, European um, sources use it or you, you know institutions may occasionally use it but it looks to me like that's all been built into this document that kind of yes, information i think it yeah. is yeah we okay. have uh, quite a, a clear system here about which uh compounds are allowed in food producing animals in milk producing animals and also about the antimicrobials and what is first second or third choice and what should be the argumentation to use that. And for third choice antimicrobials, it is uh, uh, obligatory to show a sensitivity test, which shows that it's really necessary to use it by law. It is, uh, yes. Arranged. So, so what, what, ha what's the, what are the consequences for the farmer and for the veterinarian if, let's say, there's any use outside of these guidelines that's detected and perhaps in the milk bulk tank? tank yeah, uh, you get a, or, normally well, you get a fine, right. and I think that if it's repeatedly a problem, then well, you really have a problem as a practitioner. Uh, right. So there's there's a really strict strict rules and strict control uh, around that. So the, the, yeah, that's not uh, mild, no. <laughs> okay, and um, what about horses? You know, so horses can fit yes. into the food animal or not in some EU countries. Um, I don't know if that's yes. the case in the Netherlands. Is that true? Yeah, it is. We have for it horses is. is about the same system with this regulation as well. So those are also the allowed 
and, and, and prohibited substances in food producing horses. Only for horses, we have one additional uh, guideline and it's the EU guideline uh, 122 slash 2013. That's the six month list, we also call it. So this is a list with compounds which are well, critically important for equine medicine. And those are allowed to use in food producing horses with a withdrawal period of six months. And you have to write it down in the passport of the horse if you use such a compound. And what's also an option of course here in, in Europe and in the Netherlands is that you exclude the horse for human consumption in the passport. And then you're, well, then you can use a lot more compounds which are not allowed through these guidelines. Then it's a, it's a companion animal. Uh, so but, can you can you I, I've got some ex personal experience, uh, you know, with veterinarians thinking about passports when I was in Germany. Can you just briefly mm -hmm. tell us what a passport is for those of my those students that might not know what the passport's all about in the EU? The, the, yes, the food in, animals. here it is obligatory to 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 put a transponder in the neck of a horse, so a chip, uh, if you want to. Uh, transport a horse or even go th uh, on the street with the horse, then you have to, it has to have a chip. It's also regulated by law. So it has to be chipped, uh, transponder, and then linked to the number of the transponder is a passport. Uh, and in the passport, well, the, the identification of the horse is arranged. So the, 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 all uh, the, 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 the color and the, the marks, birthmarks, uh, well, that sort of thing, and all uh, necessary data, the vaccinations, of course, but also if there's any medication uh, if from the six months list, if it's used and it has to be written down in a passport or the horse can be excluded for human consumption in the passport. And then it's, it's a companion animal by law. And you don't okay. have to worry about withdrawal periods. Well, when you use when you lose the passport or when you well, then you get a new one, but we have to pay for it, and then the horse is automatically excluded for human consumption, of course. Right. So there's if the veterinarian does his work, and if the owner is responsible and doesn't do anything strange, then it is a good system, I think, to uh, because at the slaughterhouse. The uh, passport is, is uh, checked, and right. well, it, sh it should work the system. But yeah, of and course. so just 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 to make it clear that the chip in the horse is the, an ear tag in say cattle, correct? Or do they? There's also a chipping. I don't think there's a chipping system in a food animal like cattle. I no, it's that. the in just the, an ear ear tag. In a cow, there's an ear tag, or in, in sheep, yeah. But that's right. of course right. uh, it's that's not so. Well, it's not possible to register As really pet, well no. which medication goes in an individual cow or an individual sheep, I think. That's a right. difficult one. Okay, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Probably the, you know, the choices are probably largest than other places because there are no restrictions as to which antimicrobial you, uh, uh, you want to uh, get a hold of. Um, so basically, the the market is, you know, it's quite open, and there is, uh, you, you can actually go to uh, agrochemical uh, stores, and they sell just about any family of uh, antimicrobials, uh, and uh, obviously, you uh, you know the the main. Uh, the main ones that uh, you usually resort to are probably the, you know, the beta lactams. But I was uh, looking at, uh, you know, other uh, products that are sold for mastitis. And you can basically find all the other families, you know, uh, mm -hmm. all the other drug families in there. So uh, uh, when it comes to the scenario, uh, I have to first... Uh, you know, call attention to the fact that in Colombia, we still have the contagious pathogens as the, the most prevalent ones. Uh, and I'm talking about staph air, air, Staphylococcus aureus and uh, Streptococcus agalactiae. 
So until we really uh, tackle those two organisms, you know, the other ones are not not big players, you mm-hmm. know, for the economy in general. So uh, in this case, uh, probably what veterinarians would do is uh, isolate that animal and uh, treat them, you know, uh, for, for uh, you know, up to a week maybe. Uh, and, uh, and then if, if the, the mastitis uh, resolves, it gets back, the, the, the cow gets back into circulation again. Uh, the problem with uh, staph, uh, the Staphylococcus aureus is that uh, uh, it's probably one of the toughest ones to uh, treat because, as you know, it for it you know attacks the parenchyma. Uh, it causes mm-hmm. fibrosis, uh, microabscesses. So, you know, if if you have a recurrent cow that you treat once and, and you know. Uh, you know, relapses, uh, it's probably because, you know, it's, uh, uh, as I say, staphylococcus is, is, is just very difficult to treat. So, you know, to be fair, just to go back to your comment about being able to buy it at food in at uh, some of the agricultural supply, that's true in the United States. Uh, and it's actually been a, a, a very concern when it comes to antimicrobial resistance that the farmer can get access to these and then if you go to other part other countries it may be that there are veterinarians who are loosely connected to a web of sale um, that that occurs outside of the through uh, um, patient you know client uh, veterinary re- relationship so let me ask this question is so is there a widely known list, I think you may have answered this, draw, a list of drugs that are approved for, for food animals. And conversely, is there a, or, and or is there a list of banned drugs for food animals in Colombia? And how does that, if there is, how does that get enforced? Well, there are certain dr- antimicrobials that you need to get through a hospital, a human hospital. Uh, vancomycin, you know, uh, just a, a few selected right. ones, um, and I, 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 I don't, I don't know off the top of my head which ones they are. Uh, amphotericin, you know, vancomycin. Uh, probably- but the ones, but the ones that let's say would be second line, third line, you know, from the uh, beta lactams that you mentioned yeah. for yeah. resistant. Or would they go, or would it likely they would use some management or call the animal more likely in that scenario? They would call the animal probably if, you know, if it is a, a chronic infection that you, you right. cannot treat. Uh, otherwise, you know, they probably treat it, you know, the first time. And uh, I don't, I don't. And it might depend on, yeah, the genetic potential of that animal. You know, the might genetic, be part yeah, of it. Yeah. If it is just one quarter or two of them or three, yeah, right. uh, so probably depends also on how much milk that uh, cow is producing. You know. But is is there a list of banned drugs um, or approved drugs, like one or the other? Yeah, yeah. Approved. We have a banned list in the United States. Well, I was looking at, as I say, a formulary to uh, see which ones are uh, have an indication for mastitis. And I have a huge list, <laughs> but they're all approved. They're all approved for use in in Colombia now. Yes, because they're on that list. Uh huh. Okay. Well, and a lot of them are in the third and fourth generation cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones, which, as you know, you know, should be reserved for, uh, you know, uh, which are which are reserved in other countries. So basically, and and you can find them, you know, for. Most of them, you know, are parental, but uh, then f- I was checking uh, uh, Cifoparasone is a third generation cephalosporin and is for intramammary right. uh, uh, inject, well, uh, in- administration. Oh, Clavamox yeah. is another intram- intra, you know, mammary uh, one. And then, I mean, in the parental group, you have, you have, uh, uh, 
uh, drugs in every uh, family category. Um, so again, getting to the issue of are there any practical limits for a veterinarian to be able to use a, an antimicrobial to treat a patient, do you see? Or are they pretty, pretty wide open again? Well, the main thing they have to, work, uh, they have to uh, keep an eye on is, is not to go beyond the withdrawal time for, for milk. Uh, because they do check with, uh, you know, an, uh, with, uh, uh, how do you say it? The Del Delbo test is, is kind of a test for uh, drug inhibition. Right, uh, right. Any antimicrobial activity. Yeah. Right. So, we, so it's a milk tank, milk tank regulation, and therefore they should be wise to pay attention to withdrawal times yeah. regardless. What about meat? What about the meat? What about withdrawal? Yeah, I don't think with with meat they don't really check for antimicrobials okay. in meat. So, okay. so would the chain of responsibility the farmer go from the farmer to the veterinarian in the case of finding, say, a milk tank um, violation? It, would there be any enforcement? Yes, they do enforce there that, but it's it's enforced through the dairy companies. Okay. Uh, not the government agency. So most uh, farmers will go ahead and treat the animal without sure, a yeah. veterinary because, you know, uh, for, in, in Colombia, most uh, dairies are kind of family run and they're small. They're not, we don't have lar large herds of, you know, yeah. hundreds of animals. Uh, in Colombia, it's still white, the use of, you know, uh, hand milking is quite uh, widespread too, mm -hmm. so they still don't use, you know, uh, you know, uh, milking machines uh, yeah. in many places. Yeah. So, well, again, um, there's the pattern of mastitis in New Zealand is different from most other places. So, strep uterus would be way up the top of the list for us. Um, we have relatively hard, large herd sizes. So I think the average size is 440 something cars. Mm. Uh, there are very heavy penalties for um, high somatic cell counts. So animals with um, chronic staph aureus infections tend to get cold. So either they're sent off um, to the works or just uh, killed and disposed of on the farm. So it'd be rare for animals with um, any sort of complicated staph aureus infection to be treated at all. Now, again, the, um, the legal requirements are basically the vet has got to make a decision. Uh, the veterinary council is very keen for vets not to use critically important antibiotics unless they've got a really good reason to do it. So that would involve doing culture and sensitivity and so on. Uh, but I say in practical terms, it just wouldn't happen. The average car here is worth, even a good car is worth maybe $2,000. And if you're talking about 400 cars with high cell counts, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars worth of penalties. So right. it doesn't happen. And so that obviously that what you're saying is that that penalty that, or that recognition of that occurs at the bulk milk tank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, and how far back would the responsibility go? The farmer's uh, primarily responsible, but okay. if the farmer can show that the vet gave advice which led to problems, then the vet yeah. would uh, get in trouble as well. Okay. So uh, are there any lists uh, in New Zealand with regards to drugs that are absolutely banned? from Yes, animals? there's a very small list and it's basically um, chlorinated um, insecticides like DDT and so on, which were banned by international treaty uh, back in the 90s, as far as I remember. <clears throat> so there, the, there's nothing which is completely banned that's in general use. It's, to summarize what I understood, the practical aspect of it is, is really impacted by the type of dairy, dairy farming in this case, yeah. Um, yeah. the size of the farms. Actually, that surprises me. I, I had this vision <laughs> very small farms in New Zealand, but it's not. No, the they're all big these days. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so you've had a lot of conglomeration, conglomeration probably like the U.S., and um, that becomes a practical issue in terms of the animals um, having a, a chronic infection at all, and so being treated for that is is really practically not 
an issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting. No, the the big um, political thing at the moment is uh, dry cow therapy. The yes. Veterinary Council and the New Zealand Veterinary Association are trying to phase that out. Um, I'm not sure they'll ever manage to do it completely, but um, yeah, it's, it largely comes down to economics again. If there's some cheaper way of doing it, farmers will go for that. Right. And so, but the, the pressure to do that is uh, antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. 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 The, the resistance in New Zealand is pretty low at the moment, but obviously everyone would like to keep it that way if possible. In brief summary of the drug regulations for food animal medicine uh, around these uh, countries that we looked at throughout the world, in the UK and the European Union, very prescribed cascade lists of approved drugs are provided to veterinarians, including minimum milk and meat withdrawal times. In the EU and New Zealand, like the United States, there is a list of banned drugs for food animals. In the UK and the EU for antimicrobial drugs, the third tier choices require culture and sensitivity to be performed uh, to document their necess necessity. And the critically important antimicrobials for human infections are widely discouraged. Uh, the European Union has the uh, passport system, the medical passport for food animals that include ear tags for cattle and sheep and transponders for uh, horses. Horses must specifically be defined as non-food animals before they can be uh, regulated as companion animals, uh, allowing a wider use of drugs in, in the latter situation. Food animal use uh, of drugs is much less restricted in Colombia with small dairy operations, but enforcement occurs for milk residues and not generally meat residues. In New Zealand, cattle farms are very large with regulations discouraging maintaining animals with chronic infections or practices that would encourage antimicrobial resistance. 